Welcome to Everything Distributed. Today we are going to talk about the model. Before we talk about anything else, especially the theoretical formulation of the distributed computing. So let me remind you: Why do we care about model? Why do we care about abstraction? And then that's a very one good quote by the extra is that. You need to have a this good abstraction or good model so that we can present something or we can solve something absolutely precise. And then for distributed system, we focus on the so-called system model or sometimes we call it network model. Is that the abstraction or the set of properties that we need to know in order to solve the problem precisely? And some of the typical assumption of the model is that what can I expect from the underlying layer, and then what's the known behavior, what's that different kind of failure, so on and so forth. And remember this figure, a very simple layer diagram for distributed system, especially talking about a focusing on the message passing system. So the most basic operation that we can do is for unicast. And on top of the unicast, pure different kind of distributed primitive, we solve like different kind of problems. And then on top of that, we can use those primitive to build the programs we like to build the software that's useful. Okay, so now we starting from the bottom layer, the unicast. Oh, intuitively, we want to build channels between two nodes or between any set of nodes. And nodes is a kind of general term. It could be machine, servers, robots, or process. But from now on, I will use nodes. And typically, we assume that the channel is bidirectional. So if I can send something to you, you can send something to me. And then the message also can always be reliably delivered. And then if I send two messages, A and B, then they will be delivered in the, this ordering. So you will receive A and B. So if you remember TCP, TCP kind of ensure this property. Okay. So for most uh, distributed computing problem, we assume this kind of reliable unique case. And then the next big assumption or big modeling is about synchrony assumption. And then the simplest one or the easiest one is the synchronous system. It's that everything is bounded and then you know this bound. So the network delay and then the processing time are all bounded. So what's the implication? The implication is that you can imagine that there's a real time and then there's a work clock for everyone and then everyone sees, actually sees the work clock time. And so for that, the nodes can proceed in a lockstep and then you can define the run so that every mes message can be delivered and then the unit of time of computation can be done and then that's what everyone consider it as a run. So in this illustration, machine A and machine B, they will see that, okay, this is wrong one, this is wrong two, this is wrong three, wrong four, so on and so forth. And then for most of the distributed algorithms, if we consider a, a synchronous case, then for each run, there are three kind of main tasks. Is that I can send a message, and then I wait to receive enough number of message, and then I do some local computations, and then I go to the next one. Okay, so that's a very simple model. And then for more systems, it doesn't make sense. But like if you consider the system on the same machine, same multi-threading, multi-process, and yes, it can be considered as a synchronous system. Or even in some of the supercomputers, you can really cons you can consider it as a synchronous system. So you say that okay, that's too weak. You know, one is a more realistic one, and then the re more realistic one is that I don't know anything. There's no such bound, or that the uh, or maybe there's a bound, but like, I don't know in advance. Okay, so the implication is that. Suppose you even have a work clock time for everyone, so that tick, 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 everybody is doing the same time. But the thing is that the work clock time is not 
uh, reveal to anyone. I cannot just look at a clock on the wall and say, that, oh, okay, it's 10 o'clock, it's 11 o'clock, I don't know. Plus, each machine may have a kind of a processing time that is uh, different from each other. So that maybe for this guy, just like, oh, okay, now is the first step. But that like, this machine is really fast. He said, that, 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 okay, this is already the 10th step for me, even though they all, both these two events occur at the same clock time. So for a synchronous system, is that you don't really have much guarantee regarding time or regarding clock. So that's a very difficult case to deal with, okay? So now we have synchronous system, we have a synchronous system, is anything in the middle? And indeed, there's something called partial synchrony. And there are tons of different formulation for partial synchronies. So I will not list here. And later on, when we discuss some of the more uh, concrete problem, I will define the exact formulation for partial synchrony. But one thing to remember now is that for partial synchrony, most of the real system that we are using now rely on the, the, the algorithm that's designed for partial synchrony. For example, the Pexos is one of the most well-known one. And even for Bitcoin, it's also designed for partial synchrony. Then the next big assumption of the model is that how you know fail is called full model. So the simplest one is the crush stop model is that the nodes that kind of uh, follow the specification of the algorithm. But at some point in time, it just goes wrong. Maybe it lost power, the disk goes wrong, like CPU blows up. So it failed by stopping execution. So I like suppose this guy stopped here and then it never continues. So that's called crush stop failure. And then there's more tricky one to deal with. Uh, there's a trickier one to deal with. It's called crush recovery. So that like for the second guy, continue execution. And then here, it crush. And after some time, maybe you reboot. Or maybe energy comes back up. It, the machine comes back alive. And then it keeps executing. Okay. And then it depends on how you define the recovery mechanism. In you, like this machine may lose some data or my, you may observe some inconsistency. But like in any case, it's a slightly more difficult to deal with than the crush stop model. And I will say that most protocol are designed for crush stop model. And then if you don't really care about the performance, it's easy to deal with the crush recovery model because I, in typical assumption in the crush recovery model, we assume that that something you store inside your disk will never be lost even after you crush, okay? Then you say that in real system, it's not like that. Any weird thing can happen, right? And then there's so-called Byzantine failure. It's kind of a catch-all, the worst case behavior. So that I suppose that your system is hacked by the by a hacker, then you can do arbitrary thing, you have malicious behavior, you can send different thing in consistent message to different ones, or sometimes you can capture a model it as a model, a bug as a Byzantine behavior, because as some behavior you can never expect it or you can never explain. And then that's kind of worst case assumption, okay? And these three are the most common for model, and then there are tons of different ones. And yeah, the, so in addition to synchrony failure and then the channel, there are tons of different assumptions that you need to deal with if you want to decide something that's uh, precisely. For example, you can talk about the inputs. Is it binary value or is that more than two possible values? Or is there some vector in the high dimensional space? And then for most system, real system we are dealing today, we assume that any pair of nodes, they can communicate with, with each other, but that's not necessarily true all the time. So uh, you may be able to specify the underlying communication graph so that only a certain pair of nodes that can communicate with each other. 
Then we also have channel properties. So for example, in wireless network, you can do a broadcast, the property is different. And sometimes I will even assume something we call Oracle that can give you extra uh, kind of power to your algorithm design. For example, you can have a randomized coin, you can have failure detector. We will discuss some of them later. And then the fourth set is that they are all different thing to, to kind of model your full set or we, we can even consider link failure or yeah. And then if you are interested in more detail, please read the survey I did for maybe four or five years ago. Did I explain what that different dimension uh, or possible model of population is for the consensus problem? Okay, so now we have the model. That's very good. And then what else? But remember, why do we need a model? because we want to design something, we want to solve the problem, we want to uh, develop an algorithm on top. And then for that, you need to have a specification of your algorithm, meaning that you need to specify that what is the property, what the properties are for your algorithm, and we say that's correctness property. And when we say an algorithm is correct, we expect it to uh, satisfy this property, in all possible execution. So what do we mean by all possible execution? We mean that the execution that follow the model specification, right? So suppose you, your model said that I'm only going to tolerate at most one failure, one crush failure. Then suppose you have three nodes or three machines. You can say that in one execution, only machine A crush. And in another execution, only B crush. In the third execution, only C crushes. So that you have three possible execution. And then if you consider a synchronous network or synchronous network, then there's another dimension to deal with, okay? And then there are tons of different kind of correctness property depending on what problems you are solving. But at very, very high level, we can categorize them into two different things. One is the safety and one the other one is liveness okay and i think generally people say that what safety it means that nothing bad would ever happen and what's lifeless meaning that something good eventually happens but if you think about it it's very vague because what is bad what is good it's really hard to define it, right? It, it, especially for the non-trivial questions for distributed uh, systems. So here, let me add a little bit more formalism. The way to think about it is actually that what happened if I violate something? If I violate lifeless, then I actually, I'm not sure. There's still hope that I will achieve it because if you consider a synchronous system, you never know what something would happen, okay? But the second one is that if you violate safety, that means something bad happens. And intuitively, what do we mean by something bad happens? That means that I have some outcome, and then outcome cannot be undone, can, is not reversible. So once you do, you get into this bad state, state in terms of like state machine then you can never go out so here is a very simple concrete example suppose just a simple a uh, single machine uh, it's uh, actually a calculator you just said compute one plus one equal and suppose the calculator is handy it doesn't really give you an output then at this point you don't know that whether is violence viol lifeless or not right you can just keep waiting and then you say oh maybe some um, after a few seconds you will tell me the answer what the answer is so obviously that eventually it will produce an output it's a lifeless property then what's safety safety means that the calculator gives me some output but it tells me that one plus one equals to three then you know that I see this outcome, then this outcome is incorrect. 
So I know it violates the safety. It should, it should have correctly calculated the equation. Okay. So now let's look at a more interesting example for, for distributed computing. You only have two machines, two nodes A and B, and suppose you use, I say, TCP to build a channel or to build a 5 q from A to B. Then now I want to uh, know A want to send a message sequentially to B. By sequential, I mean that I always send one message at a time. An obvious property is that, okay, each message should be eventually delivered to know B. Because that's a property of how you send something. And property two is that the message I want them to be deliver in order because it's a five for one. Is that enough? Think about it. And the answer is no. You also need to add the third one to correctly describe what you want from this i five for q or five for channel because only the message sent by no A is delivered. So if you don't have property three, it's possible like some other arbitrary message may be delivered at B, right? So that even though something is very simple, but that once you start to think about what is the specification and what is the correctness, it really takes time and takes some kind of logical thinking to come up with the properties. And the exercise for you is to think about that which property is safety, which property is lifeless. Okay. And then now we talk about all the model and what's the correctness. Then you say, come on, tell me how to do something in real system. And then unfortunately, as that Martin, the author of a design data intensive application point out, and then as I, all of you might know, if you touch real system, all the model is not really capture or quantify what the real uh, computer behave, real system is much more complicated. Then why do we still need a model? Is that the model actually help you to deal with the complexity. And if you know what computational thinking is, this is exactly what it is about. We break down the system, by very sorry, break down a very complex problem to some manageable abstract model so that we know we can solve it and we can understand the fundamental of the problem. We can solve it systematically. We can build a framework to solve it. And you can even prove the correctness of your solution. And yes, there's still some gap between your theoretical solution and your real implementation, but at least that's one step, actually not just one step, it, it gives you insight how to solve problem. And then there's another kind of very interesting research, whole tons of a research area, say that once I have an algorithm, how do I, based on this algorithm, to build the implementation that can be formally verified? But in any case, the, the, the thing to remember is that in order to master distributed system, you want to have both theoretical analysis and empirical testing, empirical coding. They are equally important. Okay. So the takeaway is that I introduced several typical models and uh, specification and formulation. And then we also see the example say that what is the correctness property of your algorithm or of your design. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you.